We are live on YouTube. We are live on YouTube. We are going live in five, four, three, two. We are now live. Go ahead and share my screen, okay, Aggie? Yeah, you want you um let's see. Good evening, everybody. Um, Carolina Benjamin, uh, welcome to the monthly episode of the University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposiums. We're now doing these every third Thursday um, from 5 to 7 p.m. And as we all know, they kind of go a little bit longer because we have such excellent uh, discussions. We're now on session 36. And today we've got a great lineup for everybody. Um, we have um, our friend, Dr. Borba, who everybody knows and uh, doesn't really need an introduction coming all the way from Brazil. He'll be joining us shortly here. Um, Dr. Almefti, who will be uh, taking us through surgery of the middle fossa. And um, Dr. George Zanono is a good friend of mine who will, uh, who's over from Pittsburgh and he'll be talking to us about cerebrovascular and skull base, the inseparable twins. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gentili is unfortunately unable to join us this evening, but we will uh, dedicate some time to craniopharyngiomas, which in his honor, and uh, he does send us all his regards, and we look forward to, to hearing from him um, sometime in the future. So i um, like to take a minute to introduce our guest discussant, David uh, Ashler. And he's our new cerebrovascular and skull based neurosurgery fellow. He just joined us starting now and he'll be with us for a year working with Dr. Morcos. And um, we, he'll be sharing one of our cases at the end as well. So, and getting the panelists' uh, opinions. So, that'll, uh, we're happy to have you, David. Welcome. We look forward to a really exciting year. Um, Dr. Morcos, also missing in action. Pretty sure he's on a beach somewhere having a margarita, um, but he says he's thinking of us. So, Thank you, Dr. Morcos, for, for the nice shunt revision that I just did for you. And uh, But thank you really for this opportunity to be here tonight. It's very exciting. As you know, Dr. Morcos is the professor and co-chair of the Department of Neurosurgery, as well as the director of cerebrovascular um, and skull-based surgery here. Um, I'm Carolina Benjamin. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Neurosurgery. I'm also the director of the Keynes Lab and um, the Center for Advanced Radio Surgery here. Um, I specialize both in brain tumors and skull-based surgery. Dr. Ivan um, is in the OR now. I think he's going to be able to join us at some point. Maybe he'll hop in and out. Also, um, one of our co-directors, uh, associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery here, um, and he's the director of our research for the UM Brain Tumor Initiative. Um, <clears throat> specializes both in brain tumor as well as uh, skull base and epilepsy. Um, Dr. Bobby Stark, he's, the, he's an associate professor of neurosurgery here, who's also the co-director of our uh, endovascular neurosurgery and endovascular research. So just uh, to put in a plug for the rest of our Zymposia here in Miami, we've been uh, very lucky to have a lot of, uh, of the contributions from the other um, divisions. So our PEDS team um, is also doing the Zymposium on Mondays, um, and we would love to have you join us for that. Um, 
uh, the next one is August 9th. So this is actually the, the one from the previous session. They haven't uh, given us uh, the, the lineup for the next one, but it'll be on August 9th. So stay tuned. And then the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium um, organized by Dr. Ivan. Um, that is going to be uh, August 4th. And it's actually going to be um, Dr. Nader Sanai from the BNI talking about how surgical trialing, uh, how about surgical trialing for brain tumors. Again, that's August 4th at 5 p.m., so join us. Um, <clears throat> and then for our next cerebrovascular and skull base symposium, stay tuned for August 19th. Um, we have a great lineup, uh, and we're going to be focusing on AVMs and aneurysms and some advanced techniques, so join us in for that. Again, these sessions, none of it would be possible without our excellent support team, um, Iggy, Rob, uh, Roberto, Ingrid, and Christina. We really appreciate it every week can't say thank you enough. So just for um, the audience out there, you know, I want, we want you guys to know that all these symposium are recorda, recorded and they are available for you to view at a later time. Um, if you find them to be interesting, please, you know, share them either through our, de um, through our departmental uh, Instagram or Twitter, you can access them, um, but please share them with your friends or whoever, you know, medical students, whoever you think might, might benefit from this learning uh, opportunity. So the way we will have um, today's format will be, um, we'll have three speakers today. Um, George, we can have you go first, um, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Almefti and Dr. Borba. Hopefully Dr. Borba will be joining us shortly if he's not on yet. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes each, um, and then you know I'll give you maybe like a two minutes head, heads up or so if, if we're sort of going over time, but I think we have a little bit of extra time. So if you wanna go 20, 25 minutes, I think that would be okay for today. And then um, David, again, will present um, uh, something from our group here at the University of Miami for discussion. And the audience members, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. We are, uh, this is supposed to be an open discussion. We, are, we welcome your questions and there's no, there's no silly or stupid question. Feel free to ask us uh, any level of questions. We're more than happy to answer and we'll get the panelists to, to chime in for those. So if you'd like to register, here's just the website so everybody knows for all the future ones we have plans and we, we, we don't know exactly how long we will continue these for, but certainly through December and we're really looking forward to that. So join us for any and all of these that you can. All right, so the, the, live, of the, the live of this party tonight, uh, our speakers who I mentioned briefly, um, I will, uh, you know, we, Dr. Morcos used to go into the long introductions and, and makes all sorts of videos about them. Um, I'm not as funny as he is, but, uh, you know, I don't think the, any of these speakers need introduction. And the beauty of a panel like this is it really gives us a breadth of knowledge from more junior faculty to very senior faculty. And I think uh, at every step of the way, we're all learning. So we're very excited tonight. Um, and I think, George, why don't you share your screen so that Dr. Borba has a little bit of time to catch up and I'll stop my sharing here. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that's perfect, George. All right. Well, um, Carolina, it's such a pleasure uh, to see you. Um, I know we haven't caught up in a, in a while, and uh, it's such a privilege to, to be here today, um, especially with such a distinguished panel of, uh, um, of speakers. Um, I've, I've learned um, every time I've, uh, I've heard both Keith and Dr. Borba speak, I've, I've learned a ton, so I'm looking forward to this as well. Um, so uh, today we'll be discussing a little bit about the, the bond of skull based and cerebrovascular neurosurgery. And actually, Dr. Morcos comes up with this, um, you know, catchy titles, uh, which, which he gave me the inseparable twins. Um, and um, uh, I, I do about a, a third of my practice is, is vascular. And, and, you know, I thought it would be, you know, there were a few cases that I think that highlight this. So um, it would be interesting to discuss them. You know, it goes without saying that, you know, the neurovascular bundles in the, in the base of the skull are one of the same. Uh, you can manipulate one uh, without the other and uh, such the, the title of the inseparable twins. Um, 
many of the modules that we have both with open and, uh, and uh, endoscopic skull based surgery actually um, they navigate um, the, the major vasculature uh, in order to come up with these approaches. Um, and although um, both here and, and in many centers, <clears throat> there are people that specialize in, in many uh, subspecialties, both uh, endovascular, neurovascular, et cetera, um, really many times, you know, the, in the field of skull-based surgery and cerebrovascular neurosurgery, we do have such an overlap that is required at the same time that we do have to be facile, at least to some extent in both. So um, again, the inseparable twins. There are so many um, um, teachings from both cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery that, uh, that have overlap and that they're so important. For example, um, the, the vascular anatomy and its variations, um, the, the concepts of proximal and distal control from cerebrovascular neurosurgery, understanding the physiology and, and, and the electrophysiological monitoring, understanding how um, to maintain the well being uh, while um, you know, dealing, for example, with complications or a vascular injury, um, or revascularization and bypass options. Um, or, um, you know, and, and on the other hand, with skull based surgery, you know, optimizing the approach, uh, whether this is a lateral or ventral approach, uh, to minimize brain retraction, to minimize manipulation of the of the vessels and nerves, uh, but also um, coming up with uh, reconstructive options to um, to seal uh, whatever defect um, was created. And really, um, we come back to um, you know what Aristotle um, has taught us that that the um, uh, the sum is uh, is greater than its parts. So when um, these uh, teachings complement each other is in a way that actually makes things uh, more versatile, more efficient, and more safe. <clears throat> so again, I have I have four cases to share. Uh, two of them are actually cases where things went wrong and where um, uh, again, uh, having uh, some of the skills that said would serve a vascular uh, or skull base um, uh, helped. Um, and the two other cases where, um, again, having these two skill sets also was beneficial in actually getting a good result. So we'll start with the first case. Um, this uh, actually is an elderly woman, otherwise very healthy, and but she presented with um, this uh, Sylvian slash lateral sphenoid wing meningioma. You can see it's quite ugly, no good planes, um, and you know embedded in the Sylvian fissure. Um, she was the mother of uh, staff in the hospital, obviously, so no stress. Um, and we had done a similar case actually the same day. Went very well. We you know actually just almost all uh, only we used loops, but this one gave me uh, much more of a trouble. Um, it was really, really stuck, as you can see. Uh, the CUSA uh, or the sonar pad was not working, uh, even with you know maximal standings at 100 with a, a, a barracuda tip, it, it would not work to debulk this tumor. Um, there were some areas where the arachnoid would, would work uh, and we would be dissecting it, but for most of it, you actually had to cut out the vessels out of the capsule of the tumor. Again, the dominant hemisphere um, and very, very stuck tumor. So I was going back and forth uh, trying to debulk the tumor with, you know, with scissors. And here I was, um, I thought I was debulking within the tumor itself, um, but I didn't realize that it was actually a, a vessel was enveloped within the tumor that I had pulled up. Um, obviously, the first thing I, you know, you want to do in this situation is grab the bipolar and make the red go away, but you know, that's not. What you need to do, um, uh, obviously, getting an understanding of the situation, getting control of the situation. They really don't, they really don't have much room here. Um, so I, I placed some temporary clips and I tried to, again, dissect this vessel and understand a little bit more of the situation. Um, it was more and more clear that this wasn't the vessel that I could simply take. I was right under the frontal operculum. Uh, this seemed to be going to her Broca's area. And here I'm trying to actually unfold the tumor in a way where I can create a, um, something that I can, you know, potentially fix things. Uh, I knew there was a relatively small vessel, so primarily fixing it seemed kind of a distal 
um, reach. But I did try, um, and uh, here are just some interrupted sutures going in, uh, trying to uh, trying to fix the vessel. There was relatively good um, backflow. So, and then when I Doppler did, um, it seemed to be um, uh, Dopplering. So I knew I had at least a little bit of time. Neurophysiology hadn't changed at all. Uh, I did give her 5,000 5, units of heparin, so things got a little bit bloodier. But then I went to you know, finish the resection of the tumor. And uh, as you can see here, some, I had to leave uh, in some vessels part of the capsule of the tumor. Now I Doppler, the, the artery again is not Doppling. Uh, I do an ICG and it's not um, and it's not working. So I knew I had to I had to fix this. If I didn't fix this, um, she would have a stroke in her brocas essentially, and and potentially have severe aphasia. So um, the only way to do this is with an end-to-end -end anastomosis. Here um, I fish mouth everything, but uh, I, there's really no much room to invert things to do it in a regular way. So you kind of have to use intraluminal um, suturing. Um, and here is some of the, the suturing taking place. Um, I got some raw edges from, um, from the, the fissure where uh, there was some, some peel um, dissection. Uh, so a little bit of a bloody field, but a, a lumbar drain um, it helped uh, things a little bit to keep them uh, somewhat dry. So we we'll suture the back wall, um, and uh, here we're checking the back wall. It seems to be open, and then just running the front wall um, here with a continuous running suture. Uh, again, neurophysiology is important to uh, to follow. At this point, uh, given that uh, she was clamped for a little bit, I did tell them to uh, burst suppressor, um, potentially to avoid um, any harmful effects from the uh, from the clamp time. It is a help. It's a, a useful technique, sort of the open book um, suturing that I learned from Dr. Morcos to actually see what what you're doing. Um, remove the temporary clips, and and fortunately, uh, this was flowing nicely, and it was Doppler nicely. So um, after the surgery, she did wake up with uh, some word finding difficulties, um, and uh, she stayed here, you know, a couple more days. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we didn't give her a stroke, um, and she ultimately uh, did okay. She, I saw her back in two weeks, and she didn't have any recurrent episodes. So this is another case. Um, this is a patient that presented to me with acromegaly. Um, Classic signs and symptoms, uh, very nice man, extremely, extremely anxious. I had seen him twice actually, and every time I told him he might have surgery, he almost passed out. Um, but classic symptoms, um, interestingly on his MRI, um, there seemed to be an aneurysm, uh, likely a superior hypophysial aneurysm or supraclinoidal ICA aneurysm that was embedded within the tumor. It did seem to be under the diaphragma that was pushed up by the tumor. And he got um, a formal angiogram. This is not something that was potentially coilable just because it was so small. You can also see here, I was uh, um, essentially encroaching on the medial teocori recess and it's under the, di the diaphragma um, within the tumor itself. So, you know, we, we know that, especially with um, uh, acromegalix, um, there's a very high incidence of invasion of the medial wall, the cavernous sinus. So, and, you know, with uh, thanks to the work for, from Dr. Juan Fernandez Miranda, understood a little bit better the, the medial wall, the cavernous sinus. Uh, and this is um, um, a slide that Dr. Fernandez Miranda shared with me about the technique of removal, the medial wall, the cavernous sinus, which seems to be a very effective technique in achieving long-term uh, remission rates uh, because exactly of this uh, invasion of the medial wall, the cavernous sinus. Um, there is emerging data. We had, you know, this is a, one of the publications. There's more emerging data, especially with acromegalix, that this boosts the, the remission rates. And this is generally safe um, when there's no aneurysm sort of uh, right in the way. 
But what happens when you have an aneurysm right in the medial wall, the cavernous sinus, uh, encroaching on the cortical clinoidal uh, ligament, uh, et cetera? So um, again, the coil wasn't really possible after discussion. Uh, the, the, the option would be to use a flow diverter, uh, which will need a dual antiplatelet therapy for six months and then aspirin for life. And then, then what you do, if you you'll go in the cavernous sinus, um, you know, you can't take them off aspirin. I mean, you can, but with some risk, et cetera. You can do a craniotomy, address both. You can do a limited endoscopic resection, and not just not go close to the aneurysm, um, or do, um, or at, at least a, uh, attempt to uh, attempt everything at the same time. We had extensive discussions, and I thought that we could potentially do both at the same time. Uh, and this, uh, this exposure, you do have to do a little bit more of an expanded approach for this cases. So you really have to um, uh, expose the croid artery, the cavernous sinus. This is the medial OCR being extremely careful here. That's where the aneurysm comes to the surface. Um, and uh, even expand the approach, or the approach all the way to the medial um, uh, optic nerve and the, um, uh, and the superorbital fissure. I'm opening and then I'm, I'm making my way. My goal here is to try and get proximal control. So I'm, I'm going into cavernous sinus and uh, separating the periosteal layer of the dura going up um, to the adventitia of the carotid as uh, up high as the proximal dura ring. Here you see cranial nerve six that comes into view and I'm trying to dissect the um, medial, att medial attachments to, to create a, a, a landing zone for a temporary clip. So once we've done that, um, I wanted to, um, to find the normal gland, which was on the other side as expected. And uh, I went on to debunk a little bit, but I started feeling a little bit uncomfortable uh, doing anything more without getting an understanding and just getting a little bit better handle on, uh, on things. So I went ahead and opened the prechiasmatic recess here in the supracellar space uh, to try and see exactly uh, where the aneurysm is to just visualize it better and, and again, get a better handle. Potentially, we see the distal ICA there. Potentially, you could, uh, you can imagine, you can with a curved clip have distal control as well. Uh, so with that exposure, I went to um, remove some more of the tumor and see that this is the pseudo capsule um, of the tumor. Again, the aneurysm seems to be embedded in the diaphragma. So dividing the diaphragma here just to get a little bit more uh, freedom of movement and continue in the dissection. Um, this is not the medial cavernous wall on, this, on, on the medial side. This is actually still uh, the pseudocapsule, the tumor, um, which I'm dissecting. Uh, but even when this is removed, we're still not done yet. Um, we're resecting this, this part um, of, um, of the pseudocapsule. <clears throat> but we still have to remove the medial cavernous sinus wall. And this is the challenging part. Um, here again, we're going in the cavernous sinus and dissecting the medial cavernous sinus wall from lateral to medial. Uh, but I have a problem going up in that, again, the protocol clinoidal ligament, which is the strongest ligament is sort of, um, is attached and um, draped over the aneurysm. Um, so I'm starting removing at least the floor uh, uh, of the cell eye going up to the medial wall laterally and going back, do you see here a glimpse of the dorsum cell which is what I wanna see to know that I have done a complete job there. Uh, and we do an icy green and you see at least the neck of the aneurysm, the rest, the tip of it is in, again, the diaphragma. And that's, that's the final uh, part of the dissection. I'm trying to, again, detach that. Um, a protocol clinoidal ligament from the neck of the aneurysm. The tedious process, um, this goes back to the distal dual ring. And then, you know, once we dissect it enough, um, it has to be sharply uh, cut off and resected. We just, uh, some of the last uh, remnants here. And this is the medial cavernous signs. Well, we're set, we're sent, we usually send a separate specimen. And again, was positive. Um, but now, you know, this aneurysm normally doesn't need to be treated, but now it's a cyberacnoid aneurysm, and we are right there. Um, so I proceeded to place this clip at the base of the aneurysm. It's a little bit hard to visualize. Again, we have the superior hypophysials. 
Um, so we had to go back and forth. And uh, this seemed to be a good placement of the clip. And we did an ICG. Uh, and you see both super obvious seals um, nicely filling. Now, one of the issues with doing this is that you have a clip kind of sticking out. Um, and there's an issue with reconstruction. Sometimes these erode through flaps. Also, uh, if you have to go back, it's, it's a pain. So I wanted to separate the gland. Um, this is the flap that's nicely enhancing. I wanted to separate the gland from the cavernous sinus in case there was any ever recurrence there. So I put a little bit of fat uh, there, as Dr. Caldwell has uh, taught us. And uh, the key here is to cover the entire um, clip um, with, uh, with the flap. Uh, we did an angiogram uh, as well that seemed uh, seemed nice, um, and uh, there was potentially a very very small remnant of the aneurysm, but I wasn't concerned. Uh, nice resection, and then um, his growth hormone afterwards was 0.7, and still have to see him for three months to see the IGF one. Uh, but his prolactin, it was a cause accreting tumor. His prolactin was two, which was encouraging. In another case, another elderly woman, of course. Um, otherwise very functional, but she started having increasing um, both some confusion, but also some blurred vision. You see this kind of large refractory groove slash plantar meningioma with extension down into the cella. Uh, you see here, there's the frank invasion of the optic nerves. Um, and what that happens, uh, particularly when there's no encasement of the, of the ACA, is that my, my preference to do in Indonesia, I think you, I, at least I can get a much better look at the microvasculature of the optic nerve. Uh, but you can see here, there's a kind of a frontal polar branch that was kind of completely draped over the tumor. This will be relevant later. Um, you've seen this before, uh, kind of a transcript reform approach slash transcellar. One of the advantages is that we can get early control of the um, of molar arteries, which devascularizes the tumor. Uh, but we really have to expose um, the optics here. The, here the, uh, the roof of the optic nerves and the anticlinoid are enlarged, so it, it, uh, it allows us to do that. Uh, so you see the tumor, despite like significant PL invasion, it's, it's not that bloody. Uh, but you know the planes were, as expected, not very good. So we're going back and forth, kind of uh, doing uh, um, uh, internally bulking and extracapsular dissection. And I'm going to sp speed it up a little bit here, just in the interest of time. Um, again, going back with um, extra capsule dissection. One, here's the, the, the part that removes some of the uh, tumor that's within uh, the medial wall uh, and uh, the optic nerves, um, which again, I think you have a better view in the reconstruction. Um, it's kind of a long day for her. Um, again, an elderly woman. Sometimes our anesthesiologists are reluctant to extubate people, so I do want to get a scan before I extubate them. But you know, um, surprisingly, and although it, there was no humongous bleeding or anything, there was this enhancement there, right? You know, in the post of scan, she was still intubated, and that made me very uncomfortable that I was going to come back and take a clot out if I didn't do anything about it. I discussed it with you know, one of our endovascular colleagues, there's really no endovascular option here other than just sacking the vessel, uh, which, you know, we may risk sacking the ACA. So actually I took her back and did a terrible craniotomy, uh, did right there, went right there. And there was this kind of almost um, bulbous enlargement of that, of that artery, uh, whether that be, was because of, you know, prayer involvement with the tumor. So I went back you know, started the dissection again from the ICA, the ICA bifurcation, uh, got, got A1 control, uh, control lateral A1, I, I'm sorry, A2. This is the um, ipsilateral artery of Hubner that we see coming out here. Uh, but I, re I didn't really understand exactly what was going on. I tried to dissect that a little bit, like made things worse. I tried to put a clip there to just primarily, um, you know, stop this process, but it was still bleeding exactly because I didn't uh, have exact and like, a good handle of what exactly was going on. Um, so I wanted to get proximal control. I put a little cotton there is again, a trick that Dr. Morcos showed me putting the retractor over some cotton and, and using as another arm. Got um, you know, a clip over A1 and then dissected and understood this a little bit better. 
and then once uh, I could see exactly where you know the neck that uh, was there, you know, with a um, you know curved clip, we're able to um, to secure that. And we did an ICG. And things were flowing nicely. We did an angiogram with still her asleep, just because I I wanted to make sure and everything looked okay. There was no stenosis of the primary vessel. Um, now that being said, she was older. Um, she was doing, she did well in the first few days, but then had angiospasm and then uh, SIAD8 was a dangerous combination, um, but ultimately did okay, uh, did fine. She, this was a grade two tumor. And I just saw her for a one year follow-up. She's neurotagging visual acute actually improved to, to intact. And there's no evidence of recurrence uh, of the tumor. One last case, um, Carolyn, how are we doing on time? I mean, a little bit over or? I can't hear you, I'm sorry, you're muted. You're fine, you can do okay. this. All right, so uh, last case, uh, this is a, a man that presented, he had a history of multiple cavernous malformations. He uh, presented with recurrent headaches and a third nerve palsy um, for three weeks. It did not improve at all with steroids. It was a complete palsy. And uh, this, um, we didn't know exactly in the beginning. I, I didn't know if there was a thrombosis aneurysm um, that was there, uh, but more and more this appeared to be just kind of small formation. The solid components, you can see them there kind of in the medial, tucked in the medial side of um, the cerebral peduncle. And kind of the, the entry to get there is between the SCA and the PCA, uh, but, um, and then had pretty tall posterior climate process disease. Um, the uh, cordial spinal tracts were pushed inferiorly. You can see actually there at the configuration of the third nerves. Um, so, Given that he was young, we decided to treat him and, um, and uh, give a chance for the third nerve to recover. The option is to do, for example, a subtemporal when it was going over the options and each lateral orbital zygomatic, contralateral one. One of the issues with all of these also, in addition to that, is that, again, you had to work under the PCA and there's a, a good part of the uh, malformation was going above the PCA. Um, so, um, I thought to use this um, essentially uh, pituitary transposition to the upper midbrain um, that was again uh, described uh, mainly by Dr. Fernandez Miranda. And uh, this is the, um, the video. Um, to do the transposition, you really again have to expose both uh, cavernous sinus and the carotids, um, exposing the uh, prechiasmatic recess, dopplering to make sure. Um, or the exact location of the carotids, you have to pack the cavernous sinus. I'm um, uh, coagulating and dividing the inferior hypophyseal artery and the inferior paracellular ligaments and exposing the posterior clinoid here that has to be divided, making my way up to the tip of the clinoid and uh, doing the same thing on the right side. Um, again, dividing um, the inferior hypophyseal artery. This has been shown to be quite safe. This mainly provides supply to the, um, uh, to the dura and uh, is usually uh, well tolerated. Uh, so here are both posterior clinoids that are, are being removed. And uh, now that the, there's no bony obstacle uh, in a way, um, dividing, coagulating, dividing the superior into cavernous sinus opening uh, in the supracellular space and starting to divide the diaphragm. I have to be careful here uh, because usually the suprapubic seals are in the, um, they're very close to the diaphragm here. You see them, they're nicely preserved and they're not well tolerated. If you take a suprapubic seal, um, you, you're probably going to end up with at least some hypopituitarism. Um, and we're making our way back, uh, opening the, through this thickened membrane of Lilliquist. And uh, you can see glimpses uh, here, uh, a glimpse of, of uh, the lesion here. These are the third nerve actually flattened. Uh, you see the SCA and the PCA up on top. These are the PCOM um, kind of dissecting uh, out this lesion. Um, I wanted to still make sure that this is not a thrombose aneurysm. We did another ICG. Um, and this was negative. And then we entered the lesion. You can see it's, an, it's a, a nice approach that gets you straight to where you need to get. These are the solid components of the lesion. 
Um, these are some the nasal uh, dissecting instruments that are uh, very useful for kind of grasping. Um, and the, again, the solid components weren't that large. Uh, we're able to see again under the um, P1 and no working through the P1 perforators, but under the P1 where there are no perforators um, and get a good look there and, and make sure that there's no residual. The reconstruction, you know, multi layered as usual. Uh, he did get a transient DI. Uh, usually that happens sometimes from mapping manipulation of the gland when we do the posterior clientectomy. Um, he, uh, I, he was seen at one year of follow up. Um, he's never, his current nerve three never completely recovered. Uh, he could open his eye, but he's still seeing double. Um, but we didn't have any evidence of recurrence. Um, we're sorry, back. So, in conclusion, um, again, skull based surgery and cerebrovascular neurosurgery are, are very complementary uh, in a way that the whole is greater than its parts. Um, and uh, the complement of this skill set um, can increase the versatility, effectiveness, and safety of what we do. Um, I'm very grateful to the pit, to the Miami group. Um, is uh, uh, a picture from just before I finished my fellowship. Um, that's what you have to look forward to, David. <laughs> uh, I made some very good friends there, and again, I'm I'm grateful for all the for everything I've learned. Uh, so this is um, this is all I had to say. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you, George. Wow, well, excellent uh, talk and really tough cases. And I think that was an excellent way to open up this session and just really highlight how both skull base and cerebrovascular really go hand in hand. Um, Dr. Borba, welcome. How are you doing? Tai? He's driving still. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Look at I'm, the road. Look I'm at just... the road. Don't look at us. Okay, I think 50, 50 minutes I'll be okay. Perfect. Take your time. All right. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry. No problem. Okay. Dr. Al Mufti, do you want to share your screen and then we'll we'll get started with your uh, with your talk and then Dr. Borba will go after. Great. Good morning and thank you for the invitation. So uh, am I sharing? Yep, if you could just go on uh, full screen mode, that's perfect. Let's see, do you have full screen mode now? It's... Not yet. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a blank screen whenever I change it to full screen. Um, so I can present in this mode. Iggy, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Is there anything else that perhaps he can try? Uh, he's doing all the right things. So maybe there's a glitch. Turn it off and on. But that he's pretty good the way it is there, though. Yeah, it looks good. It looks OK. OK. Perfect. Uh, so I'll be speaking of surgery of the middle uh, cranial fossa. Uh, you know, the, middle, the boundaries of the middle cranial fossa um, are, are really the sphenoid wing, the greater wing and the sphenoid anteriorly, uh, the petrous portion of the temporal bone posteriorly, uh, the squama of the temporal bone and the parietal bone laterally. Uh, and medially uh, extending uh, across the uh, diaphragma to the contralateral side. Uh, I really think of the middle cranial fossa in a few different parts, and we'll touch on that in a little bit, but contained within the middle cranial fossa is a, a plethora of anatomical structures, including the cavernous sinus uh, anatomy and the uh, nerves of the cavernous sinus, 
uh, the entire uh, extra arachnoidal intracranial portion of the carotid artery uh, in the, um, the cochlea and the vestibule. Um, uh, a number of different pathologies can obviously arise from uh, each of these uh, portions. Uh, the, I think the pitfalls of operating in this area uh, are really, uh, this is a highly dissected view in the uh, intraoperative view, or at least the initial exposure uh, of the area uh, looks uh, more like this, which is just a mound of uh, bone and um, a, a red hue to the field. Uh, and somewhere within that, you need to either uh, get to or avoid uh, many of these um, structures. Uh, and oftentimes, I think starting out uh, operating in this er area, it can feel a little bit like being lost in the woods. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the woods uh, as a kid in Arkansas, uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, pitfalls to being in the woods uh, once you lose track from where you are, uh, because everything begins to look the same and eventually you lose a sense of direction. You don't know your north from your south and you just see uh, trees and you know the skies above you and the grounds below you, but that may be it. And so, uh, you know, we all have become so reliant on our uh, maps and we were so reliant on our navigation, but oftentimes the navigation uh, is very uh, uh, misleading in this area because those critical structures are within a few millimeters of each other. So while I may want to be at the uh, at V3, I don't want to be in the carotid artery uh, and you can be misled because uh, that's within the area of your navigation. Um, so what you really need is um, a landmark. Anybody that has spent any time in Boston knows uh, this landmark. Uh, I was in Boston visiting my father the other week and it was pouring down rain and I dropped my parents and my kids and wife off at uh, the front of the museum and I thought well I'll just make the block uh, and find parking and come back and if you've driven in Boston you know that three right turns uh, doesn't bring you back where you started it takes you to New Hampshire uh, and I actually had forgotten my phone at the hotel uh, and so I dropped them off and uh, about an hour and a half later driving around Boston lost I finally see the Sitco sign uh, which for somebody that lived in Boston, the Sitco sign was everything to me. Um, and uh, from the Sitco sign, I knew how to get to my hotel. From my hotel, I was able to get my telephone and get directions <laughs> on Google Maps back to the airport. And that's a little bit like uh, what you see here, which is the first view uh, of the middle fossa that you might get, which is just a mound of bone uh, that really has all of that critical anatomy with it. And so we need landmarks, and to me, you need a series of landmarks, and the most important of which uh, is the first landmark, which is the middle meningeal uh, artery. Uh, once that middle meningeal artery is identified, uh, uh, I see this, right? Uh, all I need to do is see that middle meningeal, and I know that the V3 is just a little bit, uh, um, more, going to be a little bit more medial to me and a little anterior to me. I know that the carotid is going to be just behind me. Uh, my next landmark after finding the middle meningeal is finding V3, really identifying the foramen. And then my next landmark is identifying GSPN. Uh, and once I have GSPN, I'm set. And in fact, I feel a little anxious in the case uh, until I've really identified the GSPN because um, uh, once you've done that, uh, the danger of the dissection is the exposed geniculate. Um, or an exposed carotid, uh, and if you have GSPN, you know how to avoid those things, uh, and then you can really bring yourself back to the petrous apex uh, into these other uh, regions that you want uh, to operate on. Um, so the, uh, the, the trick is really turning this picture, uh, which uh, is relatively useless, uh, into at least being able to visualize this picture. You, you still may not see it, uh, you know, hopefully you'll never, uh, unless you're going there for some reason, uh, going to see the cochlea. But once you know where GSPN is, once you know where the superior semicircular canal is, uh, you know where the IAC is, you know where the cochlea is, you know where the carotid is. Um, 
Uh, and then I think the uh, next step is a little bit the dissection technique. Um, I think of two gatekeepers to the middle cranial fossa, and they're both arteries. So if, you, if you're going to the middle portion of the middle cranial fossa, you're really looking for the middle meningeal artery, and you'll need to coagulate and cut that. If you're going to the, um, the upper cavernous sinus, uh, the meningeal orbital band and the meningeal orbital artery uh, are your uh, landmark and gatekeeper to that region. Um, uh, the next portion of the technique is understanding these dural layers uh, of the cavernous sinus uh, with this outer uh, uh, meningeal layer in orange here and the endosteal layer uh, in green that envelops the nerves. Uh, and as, as you dissect along uh, between these spaces, it really unlocks that space uh, and allows you to uh, work with it. Um, so I think the keys to operating there are to, to know the map, to identify the landmarks. Facial nerve monitoring is very useful. You can stimulate the facial nerve through GSPN at high thresholds and get a response, even if you're distally on the nerve. Uh, and then your dissection technique, and your dissection technique is, is very important in being able to work with the drill to uh, unroof structures and identify them as you go. And I think of it a little bit as paleontology. You know, when you first start, you kind of get the idea that there's a bone there, there's something there, but you don't know if it's a cat or a dinosaur. Uh, but as you work along uh, and slowly uh, brush uh, things away or dissect the layers of the cavernous sinus, the anatomy becomes much clearer. Um, I think uh, as you, you know, people love triangles and skull base for whatever reason. Um, uh, and there's a lot of different triangles in this space. Uh, I really think of the middle cranial fossa in, in these sections that I've laid out. And I, I think of them that way because uh, that's generally how the pathology uh, affects it. Uh, and for me, um, uh, you know, there's five or six real spaces. There's uh, this lateral space that can take you to the infratemporal fossa if you need, if you need to, uh, which is really lateral to all of the middle fossa structures. It's actually the much largest portion of the middle cranial fossa. This area that we do most of our work medially uh, is really a fraction. That's part of uh, the way you get lost is you have this big sea of bone that's, um, that we're not working in. And then medially you have this small uh, uh, smaller, uh, dense uh, area. Uh, I think the next uh, area of importance is this petrous apex that provides you access to the brainstem, uh, the basilar trunk, uh, petroclival meningiomas, uh, and so, and uh, of course, the chondrosarcomas and chordomas love to go there uh, as well. Uh, you have the IAC, uh, which uh, you may use for um, uh, small acoustic neuromas, uh, and then you have the tegmen where you get a, a uh, some uh, other problems. Um, so I think the pathologies uh, really follow this. Uh, the IAC harbors small tumors. Uh, the tegmen, you may have uh, encephaloceles or cholesteatomas, and then this uh, semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. Uh, the petrous apex has a number of different uh, uh, neoplasms that occur. The infratemporal fossa can have another of tumors. And of course, the cavernous sinus pathologies. Uh, and uh, so that's why I break this area up, in, at least in my mind, to these areas, because each of them is a little bit of a different approach and a, a little bit of a different uh, uh, surgical strategy. Uh, here's just a, a smattering of different uh, pathologies that you might encounter in this area, uh, in, including meningiomas, brainstem lesions, uh, chondrosarcomas. Um, uh, here is uh, uh, more of the same. Uh, I think one one question that people ask: Will you cut? To, do you cut the zygoma or not? Um, I uh, it depends where I'm going. So if you look uh, at uh, a lateral view of the um, uh, of the temporal lobe, um, the temporal lobe sinks uh, inferiorly as it comes uh, here, is uh, where the EAC would be. Uh, and as you're going uh, uh, anterior to the EAC or IAC, um, the temporal lobe really sinks. So if I'm working here or back, uh, which is essentially where the zygoma is, the zygoma is in a line 
um, right here. Uh, then I don't cut the zygoma because if I'm working over the IAC or I'm working over the tegmen, uh, th there's really no need. You can get on the floor uh, of the middle fossa without doing that. Uh, if I'm going to the cavernous sinus or the petrous apex, I do cut the zygoma and I do for this reason. This is a live trajectory view uh, uh, in the operating room. This wasn't staged uh, whatsoever. Uh, but And you can see that the view is flush with the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Uh, and that really avoids this retraction on the temporal lobe, uh, which you already have some and any that you can uh, diminish is useful. That cuts very simple. You just, you don't need to do anything with the orbit. You don't need to do anything with the maxilla. You just make a front cut and a back cut in the zygoma. You leave it attached to the masseter. You flip it down you reattach it uh, and the masseter stays attached uh, and there's really no uh, 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 mastication problems after that. So I just wanna march a few, a few uh, uh, cases that represent each space. Uh, first is the Tegman, which is the light blue back here. Uh, and uh, here's a, a common uh, problem of the Tegman, uh, which is an encephalus seal. This is a, a middle-aged man that uh, had some left-sided uh, conductive hearing loss, uh, and CSF started as rhinorrhea until uh, an e uh, ENT put a, a tube in his ear and it turned into otorrhea, uh, and that's a common uh, uh, presentation of this. Um, uh, you know, the job is to fix the CSF leak uh, there. Uh, for this, um, I make a, a small C-shaped incision right over the ear. Uh, here, here's the ear here, the pina here. Uh, you make a small craniotomy. You can see uh, even with that, I'm just right flush on the floor. Uh, I'm not elevating the temporal lobe uh, much more than I need to to work. Uh, and I can dissect along that floor uh, back. Uh, I identify the uh, tegmen defect here. Uh, I, the encephalus seal I've coagulated. There's the dural defect, which I'll suture. Uh, I'll then lay a, a vascularized graft over that. Uh, and I've had a lot of success doing this. Uh, and it's given me a number of additional opportunities to be in the middle fossa. You know, a, a lot of otologists will treat these um, uh, from, from the mastoid. I, I've really connected with my uh, uh, otologist that we work with. and. Um, uh, you know, this is a simple procedure from the middle fossa and uh, just gives you some extra reps in the space. Uh, next is the IAC. Uh, this is a, uh, this case I'm a little embarrassed about. Um, There's a middle-aged woman that I thought had a vestibular schwannoma. Uh, we'll see, I was wrong about that in a minute and there were some clues here. Uh, but nonetheless, we decided to do a middle fossa. Uh, she had good hearing and desired to proceed uh, with a hearing preservation surgery. Uh, and then here we make our initial craniotomy. Um, you can see we're flush with the floor uh, here as uh, so we're minimizing retraction. Uh, here we identify the arcuate eminence. Now you can see that's a very proud arcuate eminence uh, and um, uh, is confusing where exactly is the superior semicircular canal uh, beneath this arcuate eminence. So you have to play paleontologist a little bit uh, and you drill down that arcuate eminence uh, and uh, if necessary, uh, uh, and that superior canal will become a little bit more clear. Uh, and then, uh, then you get your landmarks, right? So now uh, I have a good landmark in the superior semicircular canal. Uh, we can start drilling over the IAC. Uh, and here you see the IAC start starting to be uh, exposed. Um, uh, then uh, the entirety of the IAC exposed, uh, superior semicircular canal here. Uh, and then we'll open that dura. In this case, we opened the dura and there was no tumor initially. Uh, start exploring and, and really identify that this was a meningioma um, uh, growing from the, uh, the lower portion of the IAC, which really made this a, a, a suboptimal approach to it uh, because it was beneath the, uh, the nerves. Um, but eventually we were able to work this tumor out uh, from the nerves, and here you can see the canal well decompressed, uh, the tumor well decompressed. So that's Tegman, that's IAC. Uh, next, we'll work our way forward, and uh, we'll touch on the Petrus apex and Meckel's cave a little bit. So this is the yellow, uh, and then stealing some of the green space uh, as well. Uh, this was a uh, 
uh, Petrus Regen Meningioma, actually my partner's case, he did a, a, a retrosigmoid uh, craniotomy and had a good resection. Um, the path came back as a uh, as a grade two tumor, and uh, he asked me to help him uh, getting this residual out of uh, kind of the Meckel's cave and Petrus apex uh, region. So we went back through a middle fossa approach, uh, and uh, you can see that approach would do. Uh, this case, I cut the zygoma, I get flush on the floor, uh, and then I begin dissecting the uh, middle fossa floor. Step one, middle meningeal artery. Uh, step two, identify V3. Um, and here uh, I've drilled out the uh, ovale a little bit. That's a trick I think I learned from Dr. Borba actually uh, that loosens up the uh, V3 uh, and allows uh, you to elevate it a little bit more without it being tethered. Uh, now I'm going to work my way back, uh, and I'm going to find GSPN, which you can see here. Uh, I have GSPN. I have V3. Uh, I'll come further back. I got my superior semi or arcuate eminence here. Uh, I got my V3 here, uh, working my way forward. And so now I really have my anatomy. So I got my V3. I got my superior. I got my arcuate eminence. I have GSPN. I know where everything is. Um, uh, and once, even if I don't see it, I have my landmarks that tell me where they are. Now, when coming to this Petrus apex, you can get fooled. So one thing I always do is uh, wait and uh, dissect back until I can get my dissector to start falling down. Then I know I'm at the true apex. And I dissect here, sorry, here's V3, here's the Petrus apex. And I want to push V3 forward a little bit uh, because I want this Petrus apex as well that sits a little bit underneath. Uh, V3. If you just drill this portion, when you're done, you're going to be looking at the root entry zone uh, of um, the trigeminal nerve and brainstem only. You won't see uh, the uh, prepontine cistern. Uh, so now this looks like a picture we all recognize V3, Petrus apex. We'll start drilling that medially. Uh, we'll uh, finish that drilling. Uh, and then we're going to open the dura over Meckel's cave. Uh, that you see me cutting here, V3's here. Uh, and when we do that, that tumor will basically uh, jump out of Meckel's cave to us. Um, uh, I think the, the tumor resection in this case took 20 or 30 minutes while the dissection took much longer. That, that tumor was uh, just ready to come out. Uh, here you can see the trigeminal nerve coming out and over uh, Meckel's cave, and, and there's a good view of it as well. Uh, and we got a good... Uh, resection for her finally. Um, I'm going to skip over these two. Uh, Dr. Borba is doing trigeminal schwannomas, and I'm sure he'll show uh, much better uh, videos than me. Um, so here's the cavernous sinus uh, case. Um, now this was a 22 year old woman uh, uh, with uh, chondrosarcoma. Um, she presented with a six nerve palsy. Do you see my video now, Caroline? Yeah, we see the video. Okay. Um, and how much time do I have? You have, you have enough time. Um, the video is not playing though. We just okay. see like the initial. Yeah, so we'll get started there. just to orient everybody. Here's the orbit, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, uh, meningeal orbital band. Uh, uh, here I'll first cut that gatekeeper, the meningeal orbital band, uh, and that'll gain me access to uh, uh, the space I want to dissect in and free it up. Um, uh, in, in her particular case, I had a little bit of trouble dissecting and identifying that interdural layer. Uh, so you, you can see I'll struggle here a little bit. I think I'm in, in uh, the wrong layer uh, for a little while, but uh, eventually as I kind of work my way uh, from uh, down towards V2, uh, I'll get in that right layer. Now I'm coming to the middle cranial fossa and that tumor really encapsulated the carotid. And so, uh, you know, there's not much work in this case down here, but I wanted proximal control on the carotid. So uh, I'll kind of flush out the middle fossa floor, identify the middle meningeal, coagulate and cut it, uh, dissect, dissect a little further back, uh, expose uh, over V3. Uh, once I expose over V3, I'm going to work my way back to V4 or um, the GSPN, um, which, uh, you know, I have my landmark of V3 
and so I can find uh, GSPN pretty easily. Here's the tumor uh, starting to come into exposure. You see V2, V3, Gasserian ganglion. Here you see GSPN. Uh, and here I'm just going to open up uh, right over the carotid canal uh, just a little bit to expose the internal carotid artery. And you can actually stick a, a Fogarty balloon in there um, uh, to compress the artery if for some reason you need a proximal control. Uh, now I'm going to open into the tumor. Here's the fourth nerve. I'm really working in Parkinson's triangle. Uh, here's V1. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll open that next layer uh, and get to the tumor. Um, uh, I, ICA is going to be right here, and it'll come uh, prominently into view once we get this uh, tumor debulked a little bit. Uh, it had these kind of calcified portions, as chondrosarcomas commonly do, uh, which were, this was actually attached to the posterior clinoid, so um, those calcified portions weren't free-floating. Uh, they took quite a bit to uh, get out. I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Um, just further dissection of the tumor. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to stop here. So here, I have V1. Here's the ICA uh, uh, sitting very prominently. Uh, I was really uncomfortable working on this. This uh, sonopet uh, bone scalpel actually came into great use because I didn't want to put a uh, a drill beyond the carotid, uh, which was sitting right here. Uh, so not having that oscillating tip was very nice um, and, and ultimately uh, get a good resection uh, of this um, tumor. Um, so there's a final view, ICA, fourth nerve, V1 uh, in the tumor uh, cavity. And then uh, I think just to close the loop, the, uh, the clinoid, um, well, I think I'm probably out of time now, so I think I'll stop there. You have a little bit, you have like five more minutes if you'd okay, like. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so let me show uh, a final video um, that brings us to the most anterior portion of this. Now, uh, this woman had a... Um, uh, cavernous sinus meningioma, and she was uh, losing her vision from it. Um, uh, I, I don't have a lot of enthusiasm about many of the cavernous sinus meningiomas, but uh, I think visual law, acuity loss is a good indication for surgery. Uh, and once there, we always explore the tumor, see if it's one that will uh, resect. Here you can see we're just uh, doing the soft tissue work. Uh, I want to show this because I do want to show that zygomatic uh, cut uh, that you can make on any of these, uh, which I commonly do go in the middle fossa. I, I don't necessarily make the orbital cut, which I did in, in this case, um, but I often cut the zygoma. So we'll get the zygoma exposed here. Um, uh, here you see the zygoma, here's the root. Uh, and then we just make two simple cuts, a cut there uh, and a cut in the front. And then we flip it down. I plate it beforehand because it can be a nuisance to plate uh, afterwards because it's floating. Uh, and one wants to cut it, we'll flip that down and we can get really flush uh, with the floor. And you can see it's still attached to the masseters. Uh, so once we've done that, uh, in this case, I made an orbitotomy. Uh, I don't do that often for middle fossa uh, things, but this was going uh, to the optic canal uh, and I thought it'd be useful for her. Um, so once we get that exposure, uh, Next thing is to uh, kind of get to our gatekeeper, which is going to be the middle meningeal artery, uh, which you'll see I'll identify here. Um, sorry. Here's the middle meningeal artery. We'll coagulate uh, and cut that. Um, and then we can uh, begin peeling that. Uh, cavernous sinus wall. Uh, you can see once I start doing this, um, this tumor is, is really one of those uh, adherent uh, sticky meningiomas uh, that uh, can be um, uh, dangerous in the uh, cavernous sinus. So I do uh, resect this uh, uh, outer layer of dura uh, that involved tumor. 
um, I end up not uh, exploring the cavernous sinus proper uh, because the tumor was uh, too adherent to the cranial nerves. Uh, so now here, really, the goal uh, is uh, decompressing the optic canal, uh, performing a clinoidectomy. Uh, to do that in unroofing the optic nerve uh, is our, our primary goal of surgery at this point, uh, since we don't think we'll get a, a meaningful resection. Um, uh, here, uh, I do that in a, a series of steps. First, I uh, unroof the optic canal um, uh, that you can see here. Uh, I've already detached it laterally with my uh, orbital removal. Uh, then I'll drill into the strut. Um, and then once you've done that and shelled it out a little bit, uh, really with this exposure, uh, you can dissect that uh, the remainder of the clinoid, uh, and it'll open up uh, easily. Uh, so there's the clinoid out. Uh, here's the optic uh, canal. Um, and then the, the next step for her uh, is really to uh, unroof the optic canal, uh, open the falciform ligament, uh, which uh, I'll do here. Uh, and then even uh, this dura was involved, and it's kind of I went beyond the uh, falciform ligament um, uh, start even seeing the dura of the uh, optic sheath was really adherent uh, to the optic nerve, uh, but uh, at least got her optic nerve well decompressed, um, and, um, uh, and her vision actually uh, improved uh, quite a bit uh, with this. Uh, here you see the distal ring uh, around the carotid. Uh, we'll cut that out, uh, and then I'll open up that uh, falciform ligament, and and here's where uh, really that dura becomes adherent uh, to the nerve um, uh, with tumor infiltrating it, uh, but uh, get that nerve uh, decompressed and uh, open uh, almost uh, pretty far out, uh, and she actually did benefit from that. Uh, so I think. Uh, uh, you know, this, if you want to talk about surgery, the, the middle fossa, uh, 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 it can be, each one of these blocks can take up a, a two hour talk, but uh, I think that was a quick run through of each one of them. Thank you, Dr. Omapti, that was fantastic. Definitely a, a very good uh, tour there through the middle fossa. Um, and now last, but certainly not least, Dr. Borba, did we make it home? I think he's here. Let's see. Let me give him a call. Oh, there he is. Can you hear us? We don't hear you. Oh. I'm trying. To now we're starting to hear you. Yeah. He's not on mute. Dr. Borba, you went to your settings because you were, yeah, do you put the button down or something? Because we were, able... we were listening to you. Now you're on mute. Now you're on mute. Y'all can hear me. I got it. Yeah. Yep, perfect. My, I'll try to use this new airport. See, <laughs> I just bought one. Very expensive. I think the AirPods aren't working. If you take them out, it works. Uh-oh. Try taking the AirPods out. I think it's, I think you gotta get new AirPods. <laughs> Yeah, 
Now it works. But I cannot hear you, you know? You can't hear us? Doctor, the problem is, is uh, headphones. If it disconnects the thing, it works. The problem yeah. is it's not working. It's not connecting well. Tenta tirar os AirPods. Eu acho que o problema tá, tá, tá no, no AirPods. Tadinho. Agora a gente tá te ouvindo. I wonder if he doesn't hear us, Iggy. All right, well, while he gets uh, set up, David, well, let's see. Yeah, he's, I don't know what's going on. I was looking for headphones for like regular headphones. Do you hear us, Dr. Borba? No, he's gonna connect. Now he can hear us. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now, now I can hear you also. Okay. <laughs> you have to get new AirPods. <laughs> I tried to Agora tá. put the sound. Agora deu? Agora deu, foi. Beleza, então. Uh, my wife is saying that she's sort of speaking Portuguese. She speaks Portuguese. <laughs> 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 okay, my friends, I'm sorry and for the for the confusion, for the delay. I was in surgery and a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to be with the of Miami, our friend, Dr. Almefti, and the, the, the whole family, Dr. Georgius, Carolina, and our boss. And Jack Smorkos. Okay. Let's see if can, can you see my screen now? Good. Yeah, perfect. Just put it on the presentation mode. Good. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Some years ago, you talk about trigeminal schwannoma. There are no other option. Go there and take it out. But that time, there was no understanding how the tumors behave. There was tumor in the middle of fossa. Many people do paternal approach and go there and see the dura. And open the dura and you go inside the tumor. After the tumor going in the posterior fossa, for the tumor that's in the posterior fossa, retrosigmoid approach, I cannot go to the middle fossa. After start to come a new players in trigeminal schwannoma. Trigeminal schwannoma is not, her, is not so often. It's a hair tumor. It's 0.2% of intracranial tumor and 8% on intracranial symptom. But the patient has a lot of pain, a hypoesthesia, sometimes hearing loss, sometimes facial palsy through the middle fossa, from the gasserian ganglion, uh, um, geniculate ganglion, as per, uh, Dr. P. Kate just showed. It can be in the infratemporal fossa, can be in the lateral wall of the cavernal sinus invading the lateral wall of the cavernal sinus, can be just in the petrous apex, can be in the posterior fossa, or can be in everywhere. This is the picture from Dr. Mefti paper about trigeminal schwannoma that show how is the growth pattern of the trigeminal schwannoma. Do you know that everybody today talk about vestibular schwannoma, 100% of facial nerve preservation. I don't know why. It's not true. 6% preservation of hearing and sometimes tumor like this and they preserve hearing. And the guy that is starting neurosurgery said, why? I'm doing surgery to save your life. And these people is preserving everything. 
But the stimulus schwannoma has an issue. The facial nerve is an issue. Of course it is. See? Nobody talk about facial nerve. But what's wrong with vestibular schwannoma? Or, or uh, trigeminal schwannoma? If you just follow the anatomy, if you understand the tumor, why you should give alternative treatment as radiation therapy? Different modalities. If you can go there, remove the tumor, and many, many times save the nerve. We know that radio surgery or other kind of modality, the tumor regress, but not really disappear. The tumor is there, some tumor is still there. And 50% doesn't change. And 16% increase in size. For a benign tumor that you should just learn and understand how the tumor is. I always like to remember in the 60s, in the 50s, when the people was going back, the Jewish people was going back to Israel in that area. In the tinea captis, was treated by radiation therapy. Very low doses, very, very low doses. Today you need some, some brush. In this tumor, if this patient get a radiation induced meningioma, it's very rare, but often it's happen. See, it's rare, but often happen. All of us has a case of radiation induced meningioma or to treat leukemia that we used to take or to, to treat brain tumors. See this guy, the young guy here, medulloblastoma. There is no more tumor here. Some years, the tumor there. Radiation is good. Gamma knife is very good. Works, the tumor decrease. But you cannot talk about disappearing the tumor. One advantage of the surgical treatment for trigeminal schwannoma is this, is immediate pain relief. 100% of the case. It's very rare. So you have patient has pain in the post-op, you remove the tumor, the pain gone. This is the literature say is not me. Maybe one of the most important issue in the treatment of trigeminal schwannoma. We should understand where the tumor is located and decide the approach based in the location. But more than the location should know the anatomy of the nerve. Remember that the nerve in the middle fossa is extra dural. When the never pass here from the porus trigeminalis in intradural. When the great majority of the, the tumor arise from this area, from the Garcerian glandular, and it can go posterior, anterior, or down. And if you follow the tumor, you can do this. I just saw last operative neurosurgery, I think two, three months ago, operative neurosurgery. Very nice video, very nice video. Surgery for trigeminal schwannoma, beautiful. Middle fossa, middle fossa first, after posterior fossa, retro -seek. Why? If you are there in the middle fossa, if you see the tumor in the posterior fossa, why are you going there? Why should I stop? Why should I not follow the tumor? This is show in the literature, when you use the skull-based approach, you have 90% of room 
total removal, radical removal. Total in scale base is a word that's a little bit difficult to say. And the conventional standard approach, like Theron approach, and sometimes the only retro sigma approach, in 60% you can take it. There is one area that changed a lot in the last years, is the Petros apex. And the one approach that you learn more and more and more is the anterior Petros approach, as Dr. Kate uh, Almessi just showed beautifully. You should understand the anatomy, not only the nerves and the artery, but the bone. And I think that is very interesting. Why the people from Asia, they use a lot middle fossa? Because they have a very large Petros apex. For Latin people, you don't have Petros apex too large like Asian people. They have a big avenue here. In this avenue, you can work around. See, and the CT scan can give you the information how you can get and remove the tumor. But what the trick to take the, this tumor from the middle fossa? It's easy. Go to Netflix, okay? See this movie from Lawn Monkey. Just follow the money. The money is the middle fossa. Just follow the money to the posterior fossa. And the tumor you give you, in the most important, the arachnoid will be outside the tumor. I will show you in the next cases. This man changed the history of this approach, Professor Kawazi. Professor Kawazi, he, you know how he found out how to do this case? He was trying to open the internal auditory canal for the middle fossa. And when he was open, he was always wrong. He was going to the posterior fossa. He was seeing the basal artery. He said, oh, if I take the Petros apex out, you can go and follow and have this approach. In this picture of Professor Kawazi, he represents here a meningioma, see? But the tumor that suitable for anterior Petros approach is the trigeminal schwannoma. He used this incision. See, some people use just a straight incision. See, one, one point, and it's very important when you do skull based surgery. Before you open, you have to think how you close the hole. This is the article by Professor Omefti in 1990s. Eh? He used this to approach the infratemporal fossa and sometimes the middle fossa. The most beautiful idea in the smart idea I've ever seen. Look at that. You come here, you cut the zygoma, you identify the temporalis muscle, you go to the coracoid process of the mandible, you cut the coracoid first of the mandible, you elevate the temporalis muscle, you do the surgery, you remove the temporal, you put back. It's amazing. What's the problem with this approach that Dr. Almefti never more used? How to close the cavity. And to close the cavity, we need this friend here, the temporalis muscle. And you need fascia, temporalis muscle. We always, you have some leak. Always you have some leak in the dura. Some small hole, always you have it. It's difficult to close. And the best way to separate the intradural compartment to the paranasal sinus into the area to avoid is vascularized flap. The same that you do from the nose, you should do from the head, from the anterior part, from the posterior part, from the inferior part. 
Because this, the Petroso approach, you should plan before do it. You can change the incision, you can, you can make smaller, you can make straight. I prefer to do the incision like this. One trick for the young people, you see, use the knife to up. This way you keep this fascia here of the temporalis muscle and you rotate the fascia of the temporalis muscle back. Then it, at the end of the surgery, it will rotate down and you cover the whole skull base, the middle four. This is to avoid the most common complication in skull base, the CSF leak. Sometimes you cut the zygoma, sometimes you don't cut the zygoma, depend of the shape of the head. See, if the, pa the patient has long middle fossa, sometimes you need. If the tumors go up, not down, if the tumor go up, maybe you need to cut the zygoma. See, another trick for the zygoma cut, put first the plates and to pull this back, see? and put the temporalis muscle down. See, the way that we learned from Dr. Paulo Cadre that published Dr. Omefti to preserve the fascia. And from this part here, you can see, I must see the two holes. One cut here, another cut here. If you see this part, you are in the maximum exposure that you get. And do a simple temporal craniotomy that you do every day, see? I prefer to use in this part, the cutting bar to go more down, see? And get very simple, see? Not skull base approach, you have to say, to, to drill everything, but the skull base way to do a conventional approach. And at the end, this fascia here, you come down here and cover the skull base. Let's show a case, very simple case. Very simple case, small um, um, trigeminal schwannoma. Today I do a smaller incision, maybe craniotum a little bit smaller. You go to the middle fossa, identify the middle meningeal. One trick that I'm using now, I'm going first to the fr frontal base, take a lot of CSF and relax the brain. Lombard drain, I don't use lombard drain. I, I do this technique. Go on the frontal lobe, under the frontal lobe, carotid system, take a lot of CSF and we release. Use a lot of glue. See, it's very difficult to coagulate. Go and do the peeling of the middle fossa. Peeling is peeling. Peeling is not cutting. Peeling is peeling, see? You can leave this, the great superficial petrosal nerve with this band. Now here, one trick that I learned from the most difficult and hard way, dissect the great superficial nerve from anterior to posterior, never from posterior to anterior. I had a patient with facial palsy, man. You do a middle fossa, you do approach, the patient has facial palsy because of the approach, you wanna die, see? But the, what's the trick? Find V3 and come in this direction. What's the trick to drill the Petros apex? Do a small hole inside and go widening. This way you can see the dura of the posterior fossa, the dura of the middle fossa. The maximum exposure you get when you release totally the, fi the five, you can mobilize the five in the case of meningioma or for trigeminal schwannoma, you can follow it from middle fossa to the posterior fossa. Another trick here, superior petrosal sinus. If you wanna put glue, don't put glue back, put glue to anterior part, see? If put back, the glue can go to the sigmoid sinus. I, I, I learned from the hard way also. How to dissect the nerve? Dissect in the direction of the fibers. 
see, in this direction, not like this. It tried to open, you know, onion, see, cebolla, see, see, onion, see, you go peeling, 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 see, and the tumor will appear by itself. You can do this for small tumors, you can do for large tumors. Go inside, decompress, decompress, and open. This way, you can save some branch, and you never know if this nerve will work or not, but at least try, at least try. I have seen people show nice videos and cut the nerve there, cut the nerve anterior, posterior. Let's try to save some nerve. Maybe work, maybe not work, but at least I try, see? In this way, see, you can take and remove the tumor. I can follow this from the middle fossa to the posterior fossa. Avoid coagulation is one of the tricks to trigeminal schwannoma for vestibular schwannoma and for many skull-based tumors. Avoid coagulation, not me, sometimes bleeding, but you, you learn to work sometimes in part. You remove the tumor, now I put the fascia. See, you put the tumor back to make the picture. The people like it, see, it looks like you are doing the surgery. And now you follow from the middle fossa, put the fossa. I didn't see the brain. I didn't open the dura. I just followed anatomy. In this case, I use fascia lata. You can use dura substitute. And after that, you rotate the flap. If you learn from small tumor, you become more brave. You can do with another one. This is the way a tumor that today I do different. This I did many years ago. I was afraid to peel the tumor from the cavernous sinus. I think today the tumor can do through the nose, you know? You go inside the tumor, you can find a plan either. I think the best way is in the, in the maybe less invasive. Less invasive can do for the nose. I did peel of the middle fossa. I came from up to down. Today, if I, take, if I have a case like this, I do from down to up and just follow the tumor. You see the cavernous sinus will be in the superior part. This is the case that I told you, just follow the, the tumor from the middle fossa, follow in this direction, working inside the tumor and just Follow it is the way to do the surgery. The same situation like this. Oh, it's closed here. You cannot do in the posterior fossa. You can wide. Open the poro trigeminalis. Cut the tentorium. Coagulate the superior petrosal sinus. Open the tentorium, you open the window. Go inside the tumor. Decompress, decompress a lot and peel the nerve from the tumor. You start to do this, you can go from the middle fossa to the posterior fossa. You see the posterior fossa there, the intradural part? See the basilar artery with the V3, the V2? You just follow this from the anterior part to the posterior part and pre and post up. Another situation, same thing. This video is published in the, in the operative neurosurgery. See, you can see this here. This is a long video, I go a, a long of time. But sometimes when you try to do something, you become brave, you know? And you think you can do everything. What is the logical way to treat this tumor here? The logical way is coming from the retrosig, not from the middle fossa. Don't know why, look at this. You have a very small tumor here in the middle fossa. You have a very large tumor in the posterior fossa. But we, you will work between the nerves sometimes. And you, you have to cross the, the arachnoid and follow it, maybe open the porotrigeminalis from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa. It's logical, but I try. I tried to do this from the middle fossa. We did the same surgery, cut the minimum meningeal artery, 
do the peeling of the middle fossa, separate the dura. See, I go a little bit faster here. See, the Gasserian ganglia have some CSF leak. CSF leak, leak no, CSF. <laughs> See, you dissect the tumor that is in the middle fossa. This is small tumor there. I release, take CSF. Now I drill the Petrus apex, the small hole that now is a wide hole. See, you can come from tar, you identify the superior petrosal sinus, you can coagulate, you can put surge cell, you can put glue to the anterior part, not to the posterior part. You liberate totally the five. Now I will follow the tumor, see, from the posterior fossa, uh, see, from the middle fossa to the posterior fossa. See, uh, our, in parallel to the base of the skull. This one of the tricks for the middle fossa, see? I see the people doing middle fossa, they sit like this, the head in front of them, one spatula here, other spatula there, do a skull base approach and take the brain out. Move yourself. Move to this direction, move to another direction. You can, can move around of the skull base. Use the window that the, the bone give to you. See, now we are going to the posterior fossa and just peeling, peeling, peeling like an onion. In the tumor in the layer, we start to see, we feel the basilar artery here. What's the trick to, to stop these small bleedings here from the vein? Just glue, see? Now you go with small, you go around, then dissect, a small branch that's around the, the artery, separate the, the small branches, and go in this direction and open, open, decompress, and keep the arachnoid to the nerves, to the vessels. Protecting is different. Skull based surgery for tumor and for vascular disease is different technique. For skull based tumors, you leave the arachnoids to the vessels and to the nerve. In the vascular case, you dissect it totally the vessel and see clear. You see, we try to keep this arachnoid in this direction here. So you see there. And now, you are going separating, separating slowly from the middle fossa to the posterior fossa in the whole tumor. You come from the middle fossa. You say, whoa, where is the fifth nerve? And somewhere there. Let's see where is the fifth nerve. See the arachnoid there, the basilar artery here, the fifth nerve here. This is more bleeding from veins. You use some glue. In our fourth nerve, where is fourth nerve? See, in the middle of the arachnoid. I don't need to go there to see the fourth nerve. We know where it is, separate. With the six, look the five, from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa. Just follow it from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa. Use the fascia of temporalis muscle, put the posterior part of the temporalis muscle, to close in the post-op. See, the patient has a slight six here. See, in the post-op, immediate post-op, not six months later. In the pre-op and the post-op. Just follow the money you can take there. Today, I don't know if, what you are changing. I don't know if you are going to better for the patient, better for the doctors, better for somebody else. But for trigeminal schwannoma, for a benign meningioma, for a benign vestibular schwannoma, for a benign tumors in the skull base, the best way you go there and try to remove. Sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. But at least try, at least try. And the idea for the trigeminal schwannoma is to understand how the tumor is, how the tumor behave, 
how the pattern of the growth of the tumor is one of the most important thing. Most important thing. If you understand the tumor, you understand that the, the, the approach, you understand the way to treat this tumor. I always like to finish our presentations like this. Many, many of our mentors learn neurosurgery in the head of somebody. It's not our way to learn neurosurgery. There is no way to learn skull-based surgery. There is no way to, to learn any kind of approach if you don't go to the lab. I did course more than 15 countries around the world. I, every year, I'm proud to go to Dr. Almefti course in St. Louis. I go there to learn as a, a student to learn every day I saw Dr. Mefti dissect. I learned something different, you know? He's always changing. He's like wine. He's getting better year by year, you know? <laughs> and the course is not to do like this. You go there to see, take the head, do the approach and go back home and try in the first case. No, you go back home and open your mind. You go to the anatomy, you go to, to the medical school. Oh, this cadaver in the anatomy are, are very bad. But you are there to learn. We're not there to make nice, beautiful picture to publish nice dissection like, like Carolina does in, in Miami. She's, she's a teacher. You go there to learn and help the people. In the skull based approach, the only way to learn is like this. Our meeting is changing. Rio is still beautiful. The COVID one day will go. And you hope in March 22, you can meet in Rio to talk, discuss, and have fun around the Skull Bay Surge. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Professor Marcos. Thank you, Kate. And sorry for the long time is here. Thank you. Dr. Borba, excellent talk as always. I mean, your videos are just fantastic and the pearls are endless. So we are looking forward to having you in one of our uh, lab sessions. Hopefully we can coordinate now that uh, whenever they open up the borders from COVID. So yes. thank you. now I need the quarantine. Yes, you have to go to back. <laughs> Um, excellent. I just want to remind the audience, um, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we're going to get to them shortly. Um, and uh, David, do you want to share a quick case? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. That would be great. I'll share my screen here. All right. Well, it's an uh, honor to be able to share this case with our, our panelists today and uh, very grateful for the opportunity to be here in Miami for the upcoming year with Dr. Morcos and Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Ivan, Dr. Stark. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin shared this case kindly. Um, it's a 57 year old female uh, who presented with two weeks of headaches and visual decline. You can see our exam listed here. So our uh, exam, uh, uh, reveals um, severe visual dysfunction, particularly in the left eye, 20 out of 300, and bitemporal uh, hemianopsia, left worse than right. Uh, fundoscopic exam reveals pallor on the left-hand side, and uh, the rest of her cranial nerve exam is normal. Uh, here's her preoperative imaging, uh, which demonstrates a heterogeneously enhancing uh, cellar supracellar mass. So I'll turn it over to the panelists. Go back to the images there, David, and see what the panelists uh, think about that and we'll have, what they're thinking when they see, see something like this. Um, George, you want to start? <clears throat> um, sure. Um, I think this um, appears to be a, you know, like a craniopharyngioma. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry, David, how old was the patient? 57 years old. Um, this looks like a craniopharyngioma. Obviously, you have to have, um, you know, keep a wide differential. 
uh, that was like a something like a, a pituitary adenoma that may look very atypical, although it doesn't look like that at all, or something, um, something inflammatory. Again, that doesn't it doesn't look like that. So um, it looks very much like a periphery geoma to me. I don't know if there's any CT imaging or any to see yeah. any calcifications or. We did. We did have some calcifications on the CT, so it was sort of very your typical appearance for a cranio. <clears throat> what are you What are you thinking when you're? I mean, I think I know what you're thinking, but uh, how would you approach this? Um, so one thing that I want to see is actually I I like to get um, very thin cut, uh, heavily T2 weighted imaging, particularly the sagittals, and really understand where the floor of the third ventricle is pushed. Um, mm -hmm. In general, my um, my preference to do this case is endonasal. I like to think of this tumors as essentially intraaxial tumors. Uh, many people talk about the two layers of arachnoid, but it's, it's actually it's a layer of pia that you need to get under in order to get in the right plane. Not a, not a, it's, it's not a subarachnoid tumor. It's essentially an intraaxial tumor that starts from the stalk, and that's what you're going to get. Um, the 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 way to really look in both uh, walls of the hypothalamus, at least at least in my experience, it's it's uh, and 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 my training, I guess it's um, is to go into nasal. One of the main things that may preclude you to do that is if the um, the floor of the ventricle is pushing the weight down so that uh, the optic nerves and the chiasm is actually pushed down. It closes that supracellar window. Um, so that's that's the main other. Uh, piece of the imaging I'd like to see uh, is like a, a either a T2 or a, um, a, a heavily T2 weight or sagittal, like a KISS or a Fiesta imaging, uh, where you can see what the, your window is if you were to go from, you know, on a supracellar ventral corridor. Yeah, so that's interesting that you say that. And, you know, I think the the, the integrity of the, the floor of the third ventricle is really critical. Um, and, and I think we've talked about this before when if it's sort of almost entirely intraventricular, you really got to consider going from up top. You don't, you don't really want to um, be going through the, the floor completely. So I, in this case, uh, it wasn't uh, intraventricular. We did have a thin cut T2 and it wasn't uh, just within the third ventricle. Um, there's actually a nice corridor there. Dr. Mefti, how do you sort of, uh, what do you sort of take into consideration when you see something like this, that you're sort of thinking, you, we were thinking craniopharyngioma based off the calcifications, the heterogeneous appearance. Um, she is 57. Um, and uh, what are you thinking in terms of her visual visual decline? Does the fact that she have digital, visual decline push you to go one direction or another? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I have too much to add uh, from uh, what Dr. Zanata said. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you look at this. If it's if the ventricular system is favorable for uh, endoscopic and nasal approach, that's that's probably the most direct approach to it. it doesn't go too lateral. Uh, uh, that would probably be how I'd approach it. And it's an interesting thing, right, with the the craniopharyngiomas, the the lateral extent, because some of them that they'll have these cysts extending lateral, and I think you can you can still sort of um, yeah. that doesn't necessarily take you know, that uh, the endoscopic and nasal approach out of the picture for you, um, at least for this pathology. Sure, Professor, absolutely. Professor Borba, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Dr. Omefti, Dr. Omefti's son is different. Dr. This Omefti. is our <laughs> secret. <boy. laughs> Why are you not using Petro's approach? No, we are supposed to be okay. friends. You have to. <laughs> okay. If, if Dr. Almefti be here, the Dr. Sam Almefti, he said that to use the Petro's approach for retrochiasmatic tumor. You can see, really, you can see very nicely. Very nicely. The difficulty for me, I try already. See? But the difficult for me is this anterior part here was not easy to get. How I do it, don't tell Dr. Omefti, I will come from the nose. See, if you come from the nose, you just have the whole avenue in front of you. See, and if in the endoscopic view, you can see widely. See, you can, the problem, the problem, I had a case already. See, I know that nobody has, but I am not so lucky in neurosurgeon, you know. 
I had a case that I did chronic pharyngioma from the nose, see, and decompress, remove the tumor. I was seeing and start to bleed from a small part like this. May I put something here? Um, I don't think we see your uh, arrow. Yeah. You can see? No. Uh, now, is that yours, David, or? It's me. It's me. You can see? I put a, a blue one here. No, I don't think we see your arrow, Dr. Borba. Okay, yes. Okay, in the posterior part, when the tumor came oh, down. No, yeah, uh-huh. When the tumor came down, a small bleeding from behind. <clears throat> this is a blind area from endoscope. The people say that there is no blind area from the nose, but it's true. There is a blind area, it's the dangerous way, see? For the last part, you cannot see if the, the, the bleeding start to come from the fetal part. But the most logical way that I believe that to come from this, from the nose, you just follow the tumor. If the, if the cella is wide like this, maybe this here, have the wide corridor to go to in, in the inferior part. Yeah. See? Um, and then what, what get a little bit of the panelist opinion and what are your thoughts? Do you try to preserve the stock um, in a case like this? Um, do you, you know, you do you just sort of, uh, this, she was not panhypopit to begin, um, her, her pituitary axis was intact. So what are your thoughts in terms of uh, preservation of the stock? And I guess, what's your experience when you do preserve it, whether there's a functional preservation or you know, how often do you see that even when you preserve it, there's still a dysfunction there? George? Um, in, in the words of our good teacher, Dr. Borba, is that at least try. Um, but the, the issue, um, when, when they get large, I think it's, it gets challenging. Um, but one, one issue of trying to preserve the stock goes beyond just trying to preserve the function. I think, again, these tumors start from the stock and they're intraaxial tumors that essentially have an epicenter in the stock. So if you go and find the stock and identify the stock and get in the right plane, uh, which is that PL plane essentially or that ependymal plane right underneath you know, the stalk. I think you set up yourself for success to propagate that plane and then getting the right plane, the hypothalamus. I think, you know, at least the mistake I've done in the beginning is to treat this as a subarachnoid tumor where, you know, we like vascular, we like scalp base. So you start, you know, going, doing a lot of work in the subarachnoid space. But I think the trick with that is that, you know, then you're pulling the arachnoid and the vessels with you. As Dr. Borba said, you know, this is, it's a little bit different and a true scalp based tumor in that you kind of have to treat that like a, almost like a glioma <laughs> um, in that you have to stay within the stock. And then I get to go back to your original question. Um, if you go and find the stock and then and it's the same process of trying to preserve function with trying to get in the same plane, it's not that you're going to try and do something else as opposed to um, what you would normally do. But, you know, it, it's always dictated whether there is a part of the stalk that's thicker that you see like an entry point where, you know, part of the hypothalamus. Sometimes you can see a little bit of thickening when the tumor is the center. You can see you can follow a little bit of that um, tumor scenario down to uh, to the pituitary. Um, when tumors get large, though, it's, it's hard. I'm sorry. I want to monopolize the answer. Now, go ahead. Any any of the other panelists have a thought about that? I think that chronic pharyngioma in adult is different than chronic pharyngioma in children. In children, when you try to, to preserve the stock, it means recurrence, the great majority of the case. In the adult, see, sometimes you, you can preserve anatomically, but does not mean that you preserve the function. In this case here, if you see the, the, the gland is down, and maybe the stock is down. Maybe you can follow, you, you, you can try to save, but it's not the main goal in this situation here. The main goal is remove the tumor, the main goal is to say, maybe improve the, the, the vision field, see, and avoid CSF leak. But if you can, can preserve, it will be okay. And the only thing, when you preserve, 
a large piece of stock, see, the DI in the post-op is more temporarily, you see, you have less time, I don't know how you say, yeah. translate to me, Carolina, <laughs> dura menos, and then you have choice, menos uh, DI short, in the post. Shorter lasting. Yeah, in the, I think, but current geometry, if talk if, if neurosurgeon that do, do current pharyngeal in many many years, they do pteronal approach for this case. Ninety percent you do pteronal approach for this case, and try to remo remove a maximum that I can. But I think uh, the endoscopic approach for cranial pharyngeal, for chordomas, not too much for pituitary. The people talk about pituitary, but the pituitary, in ninety percent of the tumor you can remove with the microscope. But chronic pharyngioma change, chordoma change. See, I think is a is a big big improvement for the skull based tumor, especially chronic pharyngioma. Yeah, and I think you know I think Dr. Uh, Gentili was really he, he, I've listened to many of his talks, uh, and I think one of the things he focuses on is that's right. It's not for every single tumor, but for for this tumor, there are there are many um, times where the endoscopic approach really is optimal. And I agree with uh, George. You sort of have to look at your preoperative imaging and um, really study it closely. But the nice thing about it really is the 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 decreased manipulation of the optic apparatus. Right. If you're able to get that decompression without actually making it uh, worse, without having to manipulate it, then then you're sort of gaining there. Um, I obviously have very limited experience, but I, the way I see, you know, the the gland, the the stalk is, yeah, I agree with George. You can you go can go in there. You're not going to go in there with a defeatist attitude of this is not going to work. But you have to sort of counsel the patient. I think that's important for this patient to know. For example, I told her ahead of time we're going to see what we get, but there's a good chance, you know, it's sort of intermixed all within tumor and not really separable. And um, the two areas, you know, obviously you can get recurrence there, but you also, um, I also counseled her pretty significantly on the hypothalamus, that plane that George is talking about, that almost sub peel plane. Um, sometimes, you know, in an adult, you have to consider, are you really gonna peel it off the hypothalamus and really cause her a lot of dysfunction? Or, you know, sometimes you really get into a plane that where it, it, the tumor gives and, and you have a nice plane and you can take it out. And I think that's really important to consider and sort of get gauge your, your patients what, what they, um, what their thoughts are in terms of dysfunction postoperatively, because the dysfunction in a, in a um, craniopharyngioma can be pretty debilitating. Um, Dr. Alvamefti, uh, any other thoughts that you were um, about this tumor or anything? No, I mean, I think the things that were touched on, really the most important thing in this tumor is protecting the hypothalamus. Uh, and then I think what Dr. Borba kind of alluded to is, is really true. I think if there's one disease that, that advances in endoscopy of has improved in neurosurgery. Uh, it's this one. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think, really made a difference in the uh, outcomes for this particular tumor. Right. So yeah. So actually, uh, yes. I, but but may yeah. I say something? Please. But does does not mean that craniopharyngioma means anterior endoscopic approach. Right. Today I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, presentations. This webinar, you see, uh, cordomas. I'll talk about chordoma, just from the nose. They are seeing the chronophanesioma, just from the nose. Every case is different. For example, if this tumor had a lateral extension, was not indicated that it come from the nose. Maybe you can go lateral and see, sometimes they show the picture almost in, you can see the hair from here, see, from the endoscope. But it's not the safest way. See, does not mean that you are coming from the nose, you are safer than you are going from the head. In this situation, it's midline, you just follow midline. But it's the tumor open like this. See, the only thing that in chordomas is the, is the same situation. In 90% of the tumor, the tumor in the midline. In the midline, you come from the midline. But it's the tumor in the latter, maybe you need to come from here, second step from here, third step from here, you see, it's different. It's different, you see. You cannot train and be a neurosurgeon of one approach. I see today around the world, skull base center, skull base center in everywhere. Even in my city, there in 
a small city in, in the Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil. There is Cal Bay Center. The guy does be Twitter. What's Cal Bay Center? He never did a, a Petros approach. He has no idea what is the, interior, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Petros apex. See, we need to learn to go around the whole Cal Bay. See, you cannot be the surgeon of one approach. Let me finish one thing. When I start to study the Cal Bay in the 80s, in the, in the end of the 80s, in the 90s, no, the 90s, not 80s. And there was one very brave and greatest, I think the greatest ontology of all time, Hugo Fisch, the ENT from Switzerland. Man, this man was perfect. But he was seeing the whole world through the ear. Whole world through the ear. He was taking angiofibroma <laughs> from the ear. See? Now I see a lot of people that they see the whole world from the nose. It's not this way. You need to learn the, the balance, the way to do the skull base. Okay? One will be better, another one will be better. That's right. And that's why we're always learning. That's why these sessions are great. Yeah. You need to continue learning. For this case, I, I did choose the endoscopic approach. You know, um, another thing to consider that we didn't really talk about is whether or not you're going to use just sort of uh, push the pituitary down or, you know, some cases, whether it goes really far um, uh, inferior, whether you're going to actually have to do a pituitary transposition that Dr. Juan Fernandez uh, very, very uh, eloquently uh, describes in his papers, uh, didn't need to do that for this case just because it was a favorable angle of the tumor. Um, was wait, was able, we had a good corridor. And, and one of the things that's important, I think, uh, as you're sort of starting out, um, you know, your exposure for these, you're thinking, oh my God, it's a huge tumor. The exposure is going to be huge. Yeah. You got to have all your anatomy exposed, but the, the actual opening is not as big as you think it is a tumor that gives a little bit almost better sometimes and peels away a little bit better than, um, than, uh, some of the meningiomas. Um, so you, you're really, your dural opening, you know, you're sort of your anterior extent, you're not really doing a whole anterior cranial fossa, you're really sort of stopping at the limbus of the sphenoid there. So um, your opening doesn't become huge and you have to take that into consideration for your reconstruction because there are some tricky um, points, uh, especially with uh, CSF leak, uh, the possibility of CSF leak. But luckily in, in this case, you know, we were able to work um, in a nice corridor, it, uh, it came off of the hypothalamus very nicely, George, that plane was like perfect. I was, I was a little bit concerned about that here. Had a gorgeous view, you know, into the third ventricle. Could see bilateral, um, <clears throat> lateral frame of Monroe into the lateral ventricles. Uh, was able to peel it nicely off of the basilar and then all of the the vessels back here. That blind spot that Dr. Borba mentioned. You know, I know Dr. Juan Fernandez uh, talks about a case where he actually evul evulsed the PCOM off of P1. So that's you know you have to be prepared for a vascular injury. And I think these endoscopic cases sort of highlight that. Yes, we're getting rid of some of the um, some of the old issues that come up in a craniotomy, but you're also introducing, um, not necessarily that you're introducing a higher risk of vascular injury, but sort of more difficult to manage, right? So you have to be prepared and, and um, perhaps, you know, have endoscopic clips available or whatever you feel like you may need to, like George had in his case, um, but whatever you feel like you need to, to handle um, the situation. Um, so we were able to get a good result. The stalk was sort of completely uh, intertwined within the tumor. So we did end up taking the stalk. So she did have, so she was pan pit post-op, but we were able to get a, a good resection. We were very pleased. Uh, she did very well otherwise. Um, so you can, David, I think you can advance just, uh, we did put a little bit of fat because uh, we were concerned there was a bit, a very, very high flow leak, but we got a nice, nice resection. She did very well. Um, and go one more. I just wanted to, uh, Point out some of the you know some of the advantages. Of course, you have a more direct uh, midline approach, um, reduced manipulation, and easier access into that infraretroclasmatic uh, and interpeduncular um, tumor extensions. Um, but you do have to consider the third the floor of the third ventricle, George. I think that's very critical, and your thin cut T two is going to be really really important uh, for that. <clears throat> And then um, the disadvantages, again, you're, you're somewhat restricted. There's a huge learning curve and uh, your CSF leak issues. So as Dr. Borba said, you know, you, you, you can't be, have just one trick in your bag. And uh, when you're starting out, like myself, you know, I obviously have the privilege of having Dr. Morcos here. So that, that morning I let him know, hey, I'm doing this big case today. If I run into trouble, like, are you available? Are you around? Always have backup, you know, if, if you're doing these big cases starting out in practice there is a big learning curve and the patient really shouldn't have to suffer for for any of that 
And um, just, I think there's one more. Um, yeah, th this is just, uh, I know Dr. Gentili wasn't here today, but he has so many papers and his team really has done a phenomenal job in sort of educating us um, about uh, these approaches for craniopharyngiomas that you can probably find, uh, you know, although he's not here today, you can definitely, you should go read those if you're interested. Um, and I think that's it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, ask the audience just has a, had a couple questions. I think the first one here is uh, for George. Um, he's asking sort of when it would be helpful to embolize the tumor. I think this is referring to your first tumor, but sort of when do you think about embolization if there's a tumor blush or when do you do angiograms to, to see if there's a blush and, and so forth? I think you're on mute, George. I'm sorry. I mean, was that for the sylvia meningioma, or was that for the um, for the anterior, uh for the olfactory group? I think that was for the. Well, I think it was well, for the. So, so I guess I'll answer both. So oh for <clears throat> well, first of all, I I very rarely use embolization <coughs> um, because um, I think you can most of the times tailor your approach in a way that you can get early vascular control. Sometimes you can't. Um, but you know, for a cilia meningioma, I mean, the, the, the blood supply is going to come from the dura. You're going to see the dura. You can do vascular as a dura before you go in for olfactory groove meningiomas. Um, I don't know if anything has changed, but, um, at least, uh, traditionally these, these have been notoriously, um, you know, not ideal to embolize because, you know, the, um, uh, blood supplies through the ethmoidals and to go through ethmoidals, you can risk uh, the risk of um, um, <clears throat> blindness. But, you know, also, again, the one of one of the advantages of uh, going ventral in such a case is that an early devascularization, you're going to take the, the artery before you get to the tumor. So um, if that answers the question. Great. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Um, and then, you know, a question here from the audience for all the panelists, how, how do you treat CSF leaks after endoscopic procedures? Um, do you guys have a protocol, Dr. Almefti, in, in your group that you sort of followed, lumbar drain, no lumbar drain? You know, if, if somebody has a real uh, leak, um, we, we, we more commonly re-explore them uh, pretty quick and, and see what we did than uh, playing with lumbar drains. Um, uh, you know, if, if they had a small yeah. leak in surgery yeah. and we had a good reconstruction, we felt good about it, we might use the lumbar drain. Uh, but we're, we're quick to re-explore and make sure our flap is good. Yeah. George, are you, you guys do the lumbar drain right after the trial? Well, the, the lumbar drain, you mean or you know, during the time of surgery? Um, yeah. yeah, for posterior fossa leaks, um, yeah. they're very large leaks, like, you know, sometimes obese people. But in terms of dealing with a CSF leak, in terms of, I said, complication, you know, just like Kate, uh, Dr. Almefti said, uh, you know, we, we treat it um, pretty much as on urgency. We always go back, the endonasal cases. Um, and there's usually like a small technical defect to, to, to repair. One of the other concerns is that when you, <clears throat> when you uh, introduce a lumbar drain, you have a skull-based defect somewhere, you put, that's kind of anecdotal, but you, you uh, intuitive potential to reverse the flow. So if you create negative pressure, you're driving everything in the nose into the CSF space, potentially increase some of the, some of the chance to, uh, to have an infection. I don't, that's completely anecdotal. It's just that, I guess, one of the fears. Yeah. Uh, what about the use of fat? Um, cause you know, for this case in particular, um, we, we ended, I did end up do, doing uh, fat for the reconstruction. Have you guys, are you guys using that routinely? You know, there are many different, the important thing is that, you know, there's many different ways to skin a cat and you can see groups all, all over the place doing uh, different things. And you have to sort of figure out what works for you for the audience. But uh, what, what about the panelists? What are your guys' thoughts on fat for uh, reconstruction? Typically, we wouldn't use fat for um, a supercell defect. Um, generally, we, the use of fat uh, would be, you know, for a posterior fossa just to, to fill in the clavicle recess to avoid that pointing herniation that sometimes happen. Um, not that is wrong. It's just um, that's just sort of how we kind of evolved to do things in a way. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what everyone else is saying. 
Dr. Borba, what do you think? Fat, no fat? How, what, are you, what are your, what's your approach? You're on mute, you're on mute. You're on mute. mute. Hold on, let me see if I can unmute him. Um, oh yeah, cool, okay, okay, okay. No, no, fat is good to support, mm -hmm. see? But the most important is the vascularized flap. A very large flap, you, you can close it, they close the cavity. But CSF is not so easy, no? A lumbar drain is not so safe. I have a trick here that you use. In Brazil, some patients are uh, a little bit different. I now, into, it, when they put lumbar drain, I fix the, the bag and the patient, see? Because sometimes they go up and go, go to, to the bath, go to the other place with the, long, with the back in the head. See, and the safeguard that you used to, to take, they remove out and go out. See, I prefer to fix the back in this here. You don't have the over drainage, the over drainage. See, this is one. And this, in the other trick that I have, when I do, is uh, anterior approach, and I think that maybe you have CSF leak. I put the lumbar drain, but keep close. Mm -hmm. The other day in the morning, okay, I do CT scan. I do CT scan in the post op, immediate post op, in the other day in the morning. If you still have air, I keep the lumbar drain close. Yeah. See? If you open the lumbar drain, it will be, it will be terrible, you see? Air, CSS, uh, lumbar drain is closed. It's my, some tricks from the old guy. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, I, you know, I did use a little bit of fat. We use a, a <clears throat> for that case, and we did have a nice flap, um, nasoceptal flap, but then uh, I kept the lumbar drain closed and she did have some leaking. So we eventually did open up the lumbar drain. Um, but, you know, thankfully in the long run, she did well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the, especially it's important to, to make sure that you're not just trapping in more air because it can be, can be a dangerous situation. Let me see one more question. I think that was it from the audience. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, yeah, I, have a, I have a question for both Dr. Borba and, and uh, Dr. Almesti. Um, your beautiful presentations from, with middle fossa approaches. I, there's one thing that's been kind of troubling me and I know uh, Dr. Ali Krish had, had given some pearls of wisdom. Uh, not that much for trigeminal schwannomas, I guess, uh, but for meningiomas, the, if you approach um, through that trajectory, is, um, you know, how, what's your pearls of wisdom of finding six? Because I've, I feel every time that's that's the one thing that I'm always very, very kind of scared. I just don't like the sitco that uh, Kate showed. I, there's no, I feel that there's no sitco for uh, six. People talk about the, you know, obviously Gruber's, if it's calcified, sometimes you can find it in the posterior wall, the cavernous, and obviously you can find it in V1 and fold it back. But that's, that's always sometimes easier said than done. So I was wondering, if you had any pearls of wisdom on that. Uh, I suffer like you every time in exactly your story. Every time I see Dr. Krish I, in a lab, I'm like, show me six right, right at the uh, entry of it. Um, so I'm interested to hear Borba's answer, but uh, I've had the same, same struggle. But I've never injured it uh, on one. Right, you remarkably, you, you stay away from it somehow. Probably because if you approach something through that trajectory, it usually is pushed down. Yeah. But it's always like, where is Walter kind of thing? <laughs> Borba, tell us. We're six. Not in the cavernous sinus, at the, at, at the entry to the cavernous sinus. Uh, yeah. We're muted. We're muted. He's keeping the secret too. <laughs> The secret is liberate the five. Okay. When you liberate the five, 
you see the ICA anterior in the posterior part of the cavernous sinus, and you follow from the cavernous sinus to the, to, to the posterior fossa. If you go directly there in, in, in the ligament, I, I was trying to open a video here to show you the... the uh, if you try to, to go direct or the posterior fossa through the coming from here, the angle is different, it's difficult to find. The trick is to follow from the posterior part of the cavernous sinus the to the posterior fossa. This is, and you'll be like this. And you find it un, un, under V1 or just, just behind the posterior genitals of the carotid? Where, where exactly do you find it? Where is your goal? Separate. You separate the, the fifth nerve, the V1. See, I, let's see if it's open. The view. So you find it under V1, right under V1. That's where you always... Yes. Always I yes, yes, yes. Let's see if, if I can if I have the video here. It will be one second. Oh, my internet is not, not going well. See, you can just displace V1. You find over the ICA. It's in theory, you know? Everything is in theory. It's possible. For many right. geomas, it's different. Right, right. See, my, way, my way to think meningio, cavernous sinus meningioma is different than the... Uh, Dr. Chris is saying, see, I believe the cavernous sinus meningioma is completely different tumor. We have two types of cavernous sinus meningioma. That one that is coming from inside to outside, that arises in the cavernous sinus, and the other one that's coming from outside to inside. Completely, completely different tumor. See? And I believe that in the superior optal fissure, it's impossible to remove in my hand. Okay. I approach cavernous sinus meningioma when it's in the posterior part. The great majority of the, the, the tumor are not cavernous sinus, are macros caves that are going to the cavernous sinus, or tentorium meningioma that is going to the posterior part. Okay. But when the tumor in the superior orbital fissure is completely different. But the natural history of cavernous sinus meningioma is much more benign than that we imagine. See, if you see to follow the patient, sometimes in, they need some go to ophthalmology. I just I saw yesterday a case from, from Kuwait, a, a wife of a doctor, a neurologist, just a headache. See? Just headache. MRI is no cavernous sinus meningioma. Burn. Lost the vision. See? Other guy, surgery, ophthalmoplegia. Maybe if you don't do anything, it will be better for the patient. See? This is a paper from France that they found that 90% of the diplopia improve of the corticosteroids. <laughs> Crazy. Maybe less knife, more wine. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Borba, we actually are just, uh, we're, we're, we studied this. We took a look, you know, we hadn't, uh, I know there's a volumetric studies of acoustics and we, we looked at this uh, and cavernous sinus meningiomas are tough to, to look at sort of their volumetric growth, right? Because the measuring the volumes is, is very tricky and you have to standardize it. But we did just look at this. It's hopefully coming out uh, in JNS soon, but we sort of saw that the, the volumetric growth rate was about 23% per year for cavernous sinus meningiomas uh, in our series. Sort of looked at the, the estimated doubling time was around three years. So I, I you know, I think, you're right. Like there is a, there are these cavernous sinus tumors that are very indolent, and and sometimes you know doing something is a lot more morbid than not. But uh, I think the growth rates are actually a little bit higher than we're thinking. So I think that turns that sort of puts a twist on things. But I think you're on mute again. Sorry. Okay. Depend of the cavernous sinus you are talking about. You have tumor that's in the middle is sphenoid wing with bone invasion, and there is this attachment like a 
uh, the dural tail in the cavernous sinus in the lot. These grow a lot. I'm talking about the small one that you do an MRI, the patient has no symptom or very slight diplopia, has just a small piece of tumor inside or the anterior part of the cavern, not the posterior part of the cavern. The posterior part of the cavernous sinus sometimes is not in the cavernous sinus. See? <laughs> it's outside. Yeah. Ju okay, well, a couple more questions from the audience. We're almost uh, out of time here, but uh, Jose Nalino is asking, according to Borba uh, on adenoma resection, because how you're saying that they can all be resected with the microscope, his question is, um, how to teach residents, you know, should residents be learning the transphenoidal uh, approach? Uh, I think that's what you meant, right, uh, Jose? Jose? Hopefully that's what he meant, but I think it's sort of just like, how do you balance if you think really that they can be taken out uh, with, the, with the microscope? Um, how do you balance resident teaching in terms of the uh, transphenoidal approach? Me? No. Yeah, Dr. Borba, no. uh, I think he, he said to you, he was ah, asking. Jose Nalino. Si. This, these people from Argentina, now they are talking about, you know, they want the <laughs> Copa America now, they think they're, they're, they're <laughs> Jose Nalino, great friend of us. <laughs> this is the situation. This is the situation. We learn to do with the microscope. But when you see the pituitary surgery, by endoscope, you see much better, no? You see the, the wide view, the, 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 the training that you have more, you, you, you need a team, you need a good NT. I do by microscope and use the endoscope at the end. I don't do by myself direct with the endoscope. The guy who works with, with me, he used the endoscope. He spent several hours. I spent several minutes. But time is not important. Time is not important. But I think the training, you should learn the both ways. But the microscope, I think, is old way. It's old way. If I start to do a pituitary surgery today, today, I do endoscope. If I start today. But I feel me, I feel much more comfortable using the microscope and the endoscope and then to look in the corner. Because I have experience, I, I did a lot with Twitter. But if I start today, I do endoscopy. I think if you want to start to do P Twitter today, should learn endoscopy. See, I think the, the way that I, I think. Well, again, phenomenal talks. So many pearls, uh, a breadth of experience from more junior to, to more senior. So I think this is really a, a fantastic way for all of us to learn. Look forward to seeing everyone in person soon. I hope now that COVID's uh, getting better, we, we are enjoying the symposium, but I think everybody's sort of ready for some one-on-one -on -one time. So thank you everybody, George. Thank Kate, you. Thank Dr. you. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you everyone, Have fantastic. Thank you, uh, the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.